Hello and welcome to this episode of the Pharma Forum podcast. I'm Eloise McLennan. I'm Pharma Forum's deep dive editor. Uh, joining me today, we have Jonah Comstock, who is fresh off of the floor of Royce's Pharma US, uh, which was this year in Philadelphia. Jonah, welcome. Hi, Eloise. So there's lots to talk about. Pharma, uh, F- Royce's Pharma is a big event. So can we start off by getting your overall impressions of, of the event this year and what you heard and saw? Yeah, Reuters Pharma is a really interesting event. This is my second year going. Um, I've enjoyed it both times. Uh, I I think what makes it interesting is a lot of pharma events are focused on R&D and on the science, and this one largely isn't, with one exception that I'll talk about. Um, But they focus on pretty much everything else. So there are tracks dedicated to market access, marketing, commercial, uh, and to patients, and they have a large focus on the patient uh, there. So... If you go to this event and then you go to something like ASCO, then you get a pretty good sort of view of all sides of, of the pharma universe, which is what we strive to, to offer at Pharma Forum, if you look at the channel breakdown on our website. The downside is it's two days and it's mostly track based. And so in my effort to sort of get a little bit of everything, I think I have a harder time figuring out what the big trends to walk away from are because I may have only gone to one or two medical affairs or commercial sessions, um, not quite enough to pick up the trend there. Um, This particular year, I spent a lot of time on market access, um, partly because, as you know, our upcoming deep dive edition is on market access, and partly because the session titles and and sessions in market access were just some of the most interesting, I think, because of the ongoing um, turbulent effect of the Inflation Reduction Act, which, which we'll talk about. The other thing, and this is where I said that there is an exception to the R&D, is that for the last couple of years at least, um, Reuters Pharma has had a dedicated cell and gene therapy track, which includes not only the market access infrastructure pricing challenges around cell and gene therapy, but also some of the um, science and and interesting new um, things that are going on there. So the, the cell and gene section was a little different than some of the others because it was more oriented around a single subject and, and and then various sort of business functions pertaining to that subject, whereas the rest of the conference was more oriented around business functions, broadly speaking. So uh, kind of a long, boring answer to your question, uh, which is that I, I learned a lot. I heard a ton from a lot of high quality pharma execs, but I didn't come away with as many, I think, like obvious big trends as I'm accustomed to coming away from one of these shows with. Um, but I do have a few. And and the ones I do have, I think, are pretty interesting. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the deep dive plug. That's coming out later this year. Uh, keep your eyes peeled. Um, you mentioned that you didn't come out with as many trends as you thought you would have. But what were some of the, the highlights and standouts for you? The biggest one, the most interesting one to me by far was the amount of conversation about value-based contracting. Um, And the backstory here is that pharma has been exploring value-based contracting with payers in a limited way for maybe, I think one person said seven to 10 years. That sounds about right to me. But cell and gene therapy has actually sort of reignited the conversation around value-based contracting because it's sort of the only way to pay for cell and gene therapy in the United States. I mean, it's not the only way, but it's the most feasible. And then the reignition of the conversation about value-based contracting in cell and gene therapy is starting to show some signs of making payers in pharma start thinking about how can we use value-based contracting elsewhere. So it, it could, and then this is a big if, it, but you know, potentially this could lead to a renaissance in, in the industry more broadly. So value-based contracting, basically just saying the pharma company or, or whoever's providing the therapy takes on more of the risk and payers only pay for therapies that work is, is the short answer of, of what that is. Um, but there's a bunch of complicating factors that are the reason that this hasn't taken off in the past seven to 10 years. And one of them is that actually executing a value-based contract is very difficult. You have to agree on what it means for a therapy to work and how that's measured. And you have to set up the systems for measuring that. Um, and that's very difficult. And that brings in another trend, which is data and real world evidence and AI. So that's the other confluence here. The increasing ability of pharma and payers to do effective aftermarket 
monitoring via big data at scale is now making value-based contracting less unwieldy and more feasible. And so the combination of that and cell and gene therapies making it sort of a necessity could mean that we're finally going to move into the era of value-based care. Uh, Now, this is all very aspirational and tentative, but I have to say, I heard this conversation multiple times in different sessions I went to, and the overall vibes were very consistent. Everyone's optimistic. Everyone recognizes that this has failed in the past and feels like maybe the current circumstances are enough to to overcome that. But it's uh, not without a healthy amount of skepticism. We even heard from payers as well as pharma folks. And, you know, this was a pretty big thing people were talking about. It's like, Value-based care. Value-based care has been the promise of like uh, cost savings in healthcare for a long time. So that was the biggest one I think I was the most excited about. We can stop and talk about that or I can go on to another one. Uh, no, I think it's really interesting to hear that there was such optimism for value-based uh, care options because, as you said, we've heard about it for so many years. It's the promise. It's the next thing. It's the next big thing that's going to revolutionize the way we pay for treatment. And then it doesn't quite eventualize in the way that you you hoped it was. So it, it's, it'll be interesting to see how that actually progresses moving forward. But you mentioned payers quite a lot. And I just wanted to switch over to another topic that you that you did talk about, which is the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, how how was the vibe around the Inflation Reduction Act? Are people still feeling a little bit skeptical about it? Are they a bit more open about it now? How have things changed since last year? Yeah, so that one's super interesting um, and I think less consistent, but I de- do feel like there was sort of a narrative that emerged from session to session. And I've been sort of racking my brain about how to put it without overstating the case. <laughs> but I think it's this. Um, Pharma's still not happy about the Inflation Reduction Act. They're still not happy uh, that it's going to affect their ability to charge what they believe is a fair price for innovative treatments, especially small molecule treatments. However, it's become clear that it's not going anywhere. The legal challenges have basically fallen flat, um, and there's pretty overwhelming public support. Um, Now, we'll do a little asterisk about that in a minute. But um, the so farm companies are saying, one, this is a problem we can solve. Like we can adjust to this and live in this new world. One person, um, I think it was Mark Morgan from UCB, compared it to the Affordable Care Act and its impact on payers. You know, when the Affordable Care Act passed, payers also sort of did a the sky is falling. It's the end of the world dance. But it hasn't been, you know. Health, health, private insurers are are doing great these days. Um, and in some ways, the Affordable Care actually ended up helping them opening up new markets. Um, and so, so he said, you know, the IRA is, is like that. Like, we can rage against it, but it's not going to sink us. And we can find, like, creative new ways to work under this paradigm. And maybe it'll actually help. But the other thing that I heard a lot that I think is really interesting is that Pharma is learning a lesson from the optics of the IRA. You know, they're realizing that this was able to happen. Their lobbying groups were powerless to stop it because people are really upset about drug prices, especially in the United States, and with good reason. And so what I heard a lot was people from pharma saying, like, we want to be part of the solution, you know? We recognize that this is a problem, that it's not going away. And then this is the part that wasn't said out loud, but I think was very clearly heard. We don't want people to keep blaming us for this problem. So we're going to come and and we're going to like see what we can do. So there was a lot of really earnest discussion about how pharma is setting prices, about market access, about intermediaries like PBMs. Um, I think pharma, a lot of people in pharma would really like to stop being seen as the bad guys here and start being seen as as part of the solution. And um, and I hope that, you know, there's going to be action to back up those words. There has been some, you know, like I, I think pharma has been very complimentary of some of the out of pocket um, caps, some of the out of pocket caps in the Inflation Reduction Act. And, and they've responded, you know, by taking steps to make drugs like insulin more available. So I think that th- there's been an effect of the IRA, a, a more of a soft effect of sort of making pharma realize that 
this debate isn't going away and it's really important for them to be on the right side of it and exploring like what could that look like it's interesting to hear you talk about the the reputation of of pharma because for years we've known that the reputation has not always been as high as we would like it to be in the public eye and that did seem to change a little bit around COVID where everybody seemed to have more of an, an invested interest in what was going on in the pharmaceutical industry. You had people clapping outside of their houses for healthcare workers and how we keep that momentum rolling. It's interesting to see that people aren't just resting on their laurels and thinking, oh, we can just cruise on what we've been doing for years and it'll be fine. It's it's really encouraging to hear that people are actually taking proactive steps into seeing, okay, how can we adapt and evolve as the world around us is adapting and evolving? And pharma actually has some good points to make about their role in um, drug, in healthcare prices. So, uh, so one thing I heard a lot was like, we'd like to get away from finger pointing entirely and start working together with other stakeholders to solve this problem, which is great. But the other thing I heard a few different times was, (laughs) which is a little bit in opposition to that, um, is like, when you look at overall healthcare costs to the system, Drugs are not, you know, drugs are easy to to beat up on because it's a, it's a big one time harmful cost to a patient. But hospitalizations are a way bigger piece of the pie. I mean, the the, the provider system has a lot of accounting to do for cost too. And the thing about drugs often is that they shift that cost. So you know, obviously the the conversation around cell and gene therapy pricing is in these four million dollar per treatment therapies have to be understood in the context of how much money the rest of the patient's life of chronic care in a hospital setting would cost. So there's a real relationship between healthcare costs in hospitals and and healthcare costs in pharma, but that relationship is not always in the public consciousness. So there's there's a a strong push from pharma I think to think about healthcare costs holistically and then look at drug costs as they fit into that and Maybe that paints a little bit of a different picture than just looking at drug costs. It's interesting to hear that this term holistically is also appearing in the business side of things as well as the the treatment side of of innovation at the moment. But we've talked a little bit about the broader trends that you saw and, and things that you heard at Reuters. But were there any standout sessions that you found particularly engaging or interesting? Yeah, well, I mentioned Mark Morgan from UCB. I really enjoyed his talk. Mark is interesting because he spent a lot of time as a payer and is now in pharma, and he seems to have a really good understanding of some of those pricing dynamics from both sides. Um, So I found his talk to be super, really just kind of honest, you know, having, having worked for both of the boogeymen of healthcare prices and, like, saying, you know, we're not trying to, nobody's, like, nobody wants patients to be in this bad spot. We're, we're really, and so now here's what we're thinking about. And here's who needs to step up. Um, on the other hand, uh, and I mentioned Reuters does a good job of bringing in patients. Um, the, there's a good and a bad there. The good one, I think, is not a patient, technically, uh, except in the sense that we're all patients. Um, but Amy Niles from the Patient Access Network um, presented some fairly new data um, of a new annual report they're doing to give the United States specifically a scorecard on um, pay, on market access. And um, it is quite a good report. It was quite sobering. Um, basically, we got to see <laughs> um, uh, American grades. That's, you know, I don't know if it works the same in the UK, but that's like, uh, uh, I think it's just barely a passing grade. <laughs> <laughs> average here, very average. But that C was a, was really an average of like when you broke down the cross tabs, when you looked at uh, you know white people versus people of different ethnicities, when you looked at um, socioeconomic factors, when you looked at especially LGBTQ folks, um, you learned that you know a lot of people in this country are are doing a lot worse than a C in mar- in access to care. That, that C is being brought up by uh, you know the lucky majority but the sort of minority majority of the majority of people that are in some kind of minority are all really being let down by the system so that that was a really interesting report and um i linked to it in the live blog i haven't had a chance to dig into it i just saw the session but amy was quite good and it really set up a backdrop of like you know pharma is having all these conversations it's great that they are but like i mean the reason we got where we did with the inflation reduction act is because this is a crisis you know in, in affordability of care. So it was really useful to have her there sort of sobering. 
Now, the one I want to talk about that was sort of a miss for me, and I don't want to be too hard on um, on Reuters here, but the very opening panel was um, a woman from the lobbying group Pharma on stage with a patient, and it felt very, very strange to me. She seemed to be trying to get the patient to say positive things about the Inflation Reduction Act uh, in order to be able to prove that you know, pharma is not in opposition to patients on this. Um, so she kept asking sort of leading questions about how important innovation was. But the patient, for whatever reason, did not seem to have gotten the memo. And he just wanted to talk about his story. And uh, it was just an odd session. And it really came off like pharma sort of like desperately trying to rehabilitate their image. And it was so incongruent because that's what I was seeing a lot of last year, right after the IRA came out. You know, I was seeing that at Bio. I was seeing that at all kinds of countries. This year, when I heard from actual pharma folks, it was what I described before. You know, they were being sort of really, like, just concrete about it, saying, you know, this is the problem. Here's how we're going to solve it. And, and, you know, and really, like, earnestly recognizing that there's a problem for patients rather than just beating the drum on this, like, innovation is the most important thing. This is going to destroy innovation. We have to stop it. So that was that was like a bad throwback for me. And and it did make me feel like pharma, P- PHRMA, is maybe a little out of touch with pharma, um, which we've seen in the last year. We've seen people defecting from that group and from bio, um, you know, big, big pharma companies that don't want to be associated with this lobbying group anymore. And I, I feel like partly that was because they, they felt like they really failed to stop the IRA. But also I think you know, maybe their tactics are a little aggressive and not in line with the optic strategy that pharma wants to pursue now. Now, I'm at wild speculation here. I have no knowledge at all of the internal politics of pharma and pharma lobbying groups. So if somebody wants to write to me and tell me I'm, I'm way off base, I, I certainly will appreciate it. But it was an odd moment. And even from the bleachers, it, it felt like there was some tension there between pharma and the group that, um, you know, maintains to represent them. Especially as the opening opening session that sets the tone for the entire conference. Yeah. And I have to wonder what Reuters thought that session was going to be because I and now I'm really now I'm really talking out of turn. But it was weird. <laughs> uh, apart from the the slightly uh, hiccupy opening session, we've had some some other good sessions. Uh, off of the stage, was there anything on the floor that you heard that surprised you, or anything that that made you think? Yeah, so I did a lot of video interviews, and, and most of them are going to be going up in in the uh, in the weeks to come. So I don't want to do spoilers for those, but several of them were a really interesting, innovative companies that are innovating in interesting ways, um, either in in cell and gene therapy or in drug delivery, um, or in even immunotherapy. Um, we kind of reached the point where people are starting to question some of the big assumptions behind some of the big paradigm shifts in research. So there's an immunotherapy company, therapy company I talked to, Indaptis, who's sort of questioning the idea that um, immunotherapy needs to be super targeted. They're looking at a way to activate the entire immune system in short bursts, which they're finding has more effect in, in certain kinds of cancer and and possibly a really powerful, like, combined effect with targeted immunotherapy. So, you know, questioning this prevailing idea that immunotherapy needs to be increasingly targeted and that's the direction. And then I had a very similar interview, it, it, completely different, but very similar with a group called uh, Ak- Akigen. I had a very similar, and and they are in gene therapy and, and they're similarly questioning the conventional wisdom. It's a completely different conventional wisdom, but they're also saying, um, you know, that maybe it's not about targeting one specific gene um maybe you can uh, i'm gonna get this wrong but it was a similar idea of like the the conventional wisdom about like more precision is better like there might be something here where there's a less precise approach that is more effective in some areas and can be combined so that the innovation is really flourishing those are a couple of interesting things i heard off the stage and then one other thing I heard on the stage that I'd love to talk about is cell and gene therapy. We've talked about it a, a little bit in the margins of like uh, these other conversations, but there were some interesting takeaways um, about, about it more broadly that, that I think were, were quite worth discussing. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. So you said you spent most of the time looking on the market access track, but 
outside of that, you were talking about the the cell and gene track as well that that was new for this year. If that's if that's correct, what what were the biggest takeaways there? I think it was there last year too, but I think it's fairly new. Um, so look, the big question is all the the big questions in cell gene therapy haven't changed. Um, how do you build an infrastructure for delivering it? That's the thing. Uh, autologous therapies, you've got to take the cells out of the patient, modify them, and put them back in, which means you either have to have all of the infrastructure for taking the cells out, modifying them, and putting them back in where the patient is, or you have to bring the patient to where that infrastructure is, or you have to have an incredibly reliable, effective supply chain that can cryo-freeze things and mail them around the globe rapidly. Um, But we're talking about biomaterials that have in some cases, incredibly short shelf lives. So another interview that is going to be on the website was with um, Blair McNeil from Sumitomo Pharma uh, America. Uh, And they're working on an incredible gene therapy uh, that that will save the lives of children with uh, athemia, which means they're they're born without a thymus. It's a small number of children, but there is no treatment for them other than this. And what they can do is they can take a piece of the thymus from other infants who have heart surgery and they can use gene therapy to grow it into essentially a new thymus for these children who are born without one. They can put it in and these children can, you know, it's it's early days, but as far as we know, potentially live a normal life. Incredible stuff. However, you have to get a baby who's having a cardiac surgery and when that happens, you've got to line up the baby who needs the thymus and all of the infrastructure for taking it out, modifying it, putting it back in. And the window of time that you have to do that is incredibly tight. So you've got time pressure on the donor side. You've got time pressure on the patient side. And the guy I talked to, uh, Blair, was, he was talking about how like the only way they're able to do that is by building their own facilities basically right next door to an academic medical center that specializes in these surgeries and centralizing the whole thing. But even then, you know, it's really, it's a race against the clock um, with very high stakes. So these therapies are, are life changing. And that's just one example. And other cell therapies are, are different, but there's a lot in common where they're life changing, but they have unique and complicated infrastructure needs and trying to figure out how to build that infrastructure in a way that doesn't restrict access to just patients who live near big academic medical centers is a big problem that I think a lot of folks are working on. So that's the one problem, infrastructure. Problem two, we talked about pricing. Why do these therapies cost two, three, four million dollars? Because, and, and the answer is a lot of reasons. One is everything I just described is not cheap. But two is that these are one-time curative therapies uh, for things that were previously treated as chronic conditions. And so for a payer, paying $2 million for one gene therapy is actually a savings of way more than $2 million that you would have paid over the lifetime of that patient. Like paying a yearly subscription versus paying monthly. Now, sounds good in theory. In practice, there's a bunch of ways that can go wrong. And they almost seem comical when you say them out loud. One of them is Americans switch insurance providers a lot. So if I am on one insurer and then I get my $2 million uh, gene therapy and then next month I switch to another insurer, uh, that first insurer has only saved $2 million that somebody else would have spent. And that might seem abstract to us, but it definitely doesn't seem abstract to them. So insurers are trying to work out... um, cost sharing amongst themselves for situations like that. I heard talk about that last year's Reuters. I heard about it again this year, but this year really does seem like people are starting to figure out how that could work. Another issue is, well, we talked about value-based contracting. You know, the insurers only really want to pay for that if it works. So they have to set up these value-based contracts and and adjudicating the value-based contracts is difficult. Value-based contracting creates an inequality with smaller biotechs and, and larger pharma companies. And this is something I heard about when I went to an event with Sequence in in Boston. It's a French company that's that's gotten into cell and gene um, therapy contract manufacturing for biotechs, uh, which is that, you know, a big pharma can afford 
to do a value-based care in a way that a small biotech can't. Because even if the payer ends up paying, the value-based contract might delay that payment for two years and require them to build the monitoring infrastructure, which costs more money. And that can sink a startup, you know? So there, there's in a, weird inequalities that are sort of built in there when, with the best of intentions. A few people talked about whether or not we need a third party to manage value-based contracting and whether that would solve some of these problems, which is a really interesting idea in theory. On the other hand, one of the biggest things we complain about when it comes to pharma costs is all of these extra third parties that suck money out of the system. So are we going to create another PBM for uh, value-based contracting? Is that just going to make these therapies even more expensive? Well, that's thorny. Well, that's the place that Reuters and, and other conferences like this are great places for those hypotheticals, but it's it's seeing how those are actually put into to practice. All science is, begins as a hypothetical. But what I have always loved about, I mean, maybe that's a weird way to say it. What I find fascinating as a journalist about cell and gene therapy right now is this tension behind a science that is moving so fast and an infrastructure that isn't ready for it. Um, I think that that is drama of the highest order. But it's also really inspiring to watch people sort of come together to try to solve these problems before these drugs hit the market. I think speaking on the the idea of, of of an industry moving faster than regulators, was there much talk about Gen AI? Because we know that AI has been such a huge part of, of discussions over the past few years. Are, are people a bit more knowledgeable about about how it's being used? Are they being more accepting of it? What was the the general reaction in terms of AI? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take AI more broadly first, and then we can talk a little bit about Gen AI. Um, in my experience at the conference, I found the discourse around AI to be a little more lacking than around some of these other topics. Um, and I, I think it's just there. there is so much, I don't know, it, it feels like we're back in buzzword town a little bit. A lot of people talking about AI innovation without really saying anything, you know, we're, it's a priority for us. We're, we have to change the way we think about things. A lot of sort of like business speak truisms. Um, I don't want to name names, but. Sessions where I walked around out of them and said, what did I really learn? One thing I did hear a few times that was interesting is that like pharma is becoming more strategic about big data. Um, they recognized a few years ago that they needed data and data was good. And they started buying up sources of data without really knowing what to do with it. And, and I mean, those are not my words. I heard that from the stage multiple times. And now they're figuring out what to do with it. They're figuring out what data is good, what data is bad, how to clean and, and unify data. Um, a lot of the conversation about AI and data I heard was on the marketing side, you know, it, and one thing that sort of emerged to me, and this is a little bit of analysis for me, but I, I think it lines up with what I heard broadly, is that for the last several years, and especially since the pandemic, we've been hearing about omnichannel marketing and how it's the future of, of marketing for pharma. AI is slotting in as this missing piece for omnichannel that you know omnichannel was about getting the right information to the right person through the right channel at the right time and you know that's really hard for humans to do it's a lot of judgment calls ai and good data can actually just tell you what that right information is what that right channel is what that right time is you know we have very specific data on particular providers and how they like to get information and how they don't like to get information. And you can build systems that will make sure that the information you want to reach them is delivered to them in the way that will resonate with them. Now, sometimes that way is via a human rep who goes and talks to them. So it's not like the computer is taking all this over, but the computer is really potentially at a lot of these pharma companies sort of quarterbacking this communication in a way that stands to make it much more effective. So they're very excited about AI in pharma marketing. And um, then Gen AI is just another piece of that because once you add Gen AI into the mix, the computer cannot just tell you what kinds of emails are the most effective for this provider, but then it can write them for you or generate them for you. You know, people are being more cautious with that as they should. Everything has to go through human review, but it's very much recognized as a, as a potential, you know, big, big time saver. So I think pharma marketing is, is embracing AI in new ways. On the R&D side, I didn't hear much about it at this conference, but my understanding is that they've been using AI for a long time. And gen AI isn't necessarily more useful for them than 
the kind of AI they've been using. Now, the one area where that is, you know, maybe being challenged is some of the stuff NVIDIA is doing around drug discovery and, and being able to go to a computer and use large language models to sort of ask really specific questions about, you know, proteins and, and have it return candidates. So there, there's some stuff happening there. Yeah, I've also seen it in, in drug modeling as well, not um, large language models, but uh, AI more generally being used to model proteins and model uh, molecules as well. So there are lots of different elements there. Um, we've spoken quite a lot about what you've seen and what you've heard. There's one thing that has uh, piqued my curiosity that you mentioned in our pre-interview, um, which was a large spotted cat that you saw everywhere. Can you tell us more about the, the what we can't decide if it's a leopard or a cheetah? I think it's a cheetah. And other th- uh, no one, I mean, one person mentioned it on stage, but I don't think Reuters ever really explained it. But I think it's their, their marketing for this event is that pharma has to, I believe, outpace and this is why I think it's a cheetah, um, because they outpace things, uh, outpace evolution or something. <laughs> um, so I guess the idea is that pharma is, uh, or that technology in the world is evolving so fast. Pharma needs to be ahead of the curve and not behind it. But they really went all in on this cheetah. It was in the background of every single stage. If you look at my live blog and the photos I took at the event, it's everywhere. <laughs> And I, I just found that a little bit funny. I think I wasn't the only one. I'm slightly disappointed that they didn't have an actual like sports team mascot to come on stage as well. Outpace healthcare's evolution. That's the tagline. Is, is that something that you came away thinking was well represented? The idea of outpacing evolution? I would say yes, because that is what these conferences are about lately in just the world that we live in. Um, but I would say that this, it's honestly, it's a good messaging because it it applies to multiple things we've already talked about you know to ai certainly but also that race i was talking about with cell and gene therapy where you know the infrastructure has to outpace the the hard science so that these treatments can actually get to patients and and with market access more broadly there's this sense that the r d side of pharma is doing incredible things right now and if the rest of pharma doesn't keep up, then we're in a situation where we have brilliant uh, life-saving treatments that no one can afford and nobody wants to be in that situation. So if you're in pharma, but you're not behind the bench, it's a, it's a really, I think, you know, exciting but stressful time to try to make sure that you're putting all the rest of the pieces together to get these drugs to patients. And I, I think the people in that space take it really seriously. You know, the, the attitude at this conference very patient centric um, from, you know, from everybody. They really want to, you know, figure out how to be an effective industry for getting patients the treatments they need. And that's, that's what it's all about. Uh, It's a, it's a complicated time to be in that business. Well, it sounds like it was quite a well-rounded conference. Uh, Before we sign off for this podcast, one, thank you very much for talking with me. Uh, Is there anything else you'd like to, to touch upon that you think we haven't mentioned yet? Yeah, I had one more thing in my list of takeaways, which may make its way to the website as a as a column, um, which is that there was a lot of talk about internal um, silos. And I think this really um, ties into what we were just talking about. But these groups, commercial marketing, medical affairs, market access, patient engagement, they really need to be working together as a well-oiled machine. And that is increasingly important um, as these sort of technologies that advance. So in so much as there were conversations about digital transformation, um, which which there were, there were there was a lot of talk about cross functionality and digital transformation as a whole. I think pharma is really thinking about that, about how to get everyone on the same page. Um, there were particular talks about how to do that when it comes to or recruitment, hiring, but also Uh, you know, training and and ongoing sort of employee development of making sure people know what's going on in other parts of the business. Um, So that's maybe less sexy of a trend, but I think an important piece of the puzzle when we talk about how pharma is, uh, you know, evolving to meet the needs of the moment. Yeah, how can you meet the needs of the moment if you don't know what they are? Yeah, or if you don't know if the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing, as it were. Exactly. I have to thank you, Eloise, because I uh, even before this podcast, I was saying I, I didn't really have a, 
a good grasp on sort of this event holistically. But as we've talked about it, I feel like I really have I have sort of figured out what it was all about. <laughs> so this has been very helpful. See, now you've you've I've had the hokey pokey in my head since you were talking about I think cell and gene therapy. You put the gene in, you take the gene out, and now you said that's what it's all about. So that's brought it absolutely <laughs> full circle. That is the quickest way to explain autologous cell therapy, uh, which I, I never trust that everyone knows what it is. So <laughs> the, the alternative, of course, being allogeneic cell therapy, which is you take the gene out of somebody else and you put it into somebody. In very layman's terms. Well, thank yeah. you so much for, for talking with me today. Thank you very much, listeners, for, for sticking with us for the last uh, 50 minutes. Um, if you want to listen to the rest of the, the podcasts, we have them available on the website and you can... Jonah, where can they where can they find the rest of our podcasts? Podbean, Spotify, anywhere that you find your your usual podcasts. Basically, yeah, Apple Podcasts. There, it's it's everywhere. Um, and <laughs> uh, as a little preview, we'll be turning the microphone around in a few weeks after you and our other editor Nicole Raleigh go to the European version of the Writers Pharma Conference in in Barcelona, and I'll be interviewing mm-hmm. you about what you heard there. So we'll. Maybe revisit some of these themes. It'll be interesting to Fair see if, if the US and, and European markets have, have wildly different views and, and reactions to, to current trends that are impacting the market. One thing yeah. I did hear is that the, the problems I talked about, about paying for cell therapy are, are I won't say much less, but are less complicated uh, in single payer systems. It is it is it was remarked upon that this is a. Uh, we have created some unique problems over here with the with the United States payment infrastructure. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very diplomatic way of putting it. You've created unique problems. I'm feeling weirdly <laughs> diplomatic today. Well, once again, thank you for joining us. Join us again, as Jonah said, for that special Reuters Europe Roundup, which will be coming to you in a few weeks' time. Uh, and in the meantime, have a great day and thank you for listening. That concludes this episode of the Pharma Forum podcast. You can find more information about this episode, including a download link and information about other installments in the series at pharmaforum.com slash podcast. The Pharma Forum podcast is also available on iTunes, Spotify, Acast, Stitcher, and Podme, where you can find and subscribe by searching for Pharma Forum. And don't forget to visit our website where you can sign up for daily news and analysis bulletins and to follow us on Twitter at at Pharma Forum. Thanks for listening. Thank you.